So we're very fortunate to have the uh, founders of uh, Azat here today. Um, first, uh, we're going to get a quick introduction from uh, Dr. Ranjan uh, Nag. Yeah, no. Yes, Nag. Um, and uh, Dr. Nag uh, is a seasoned entrepreneur and has over 30 years of experience working with neural networks. Uh, he co-founded uh, Lexcus, a company that created software for the earliest smartphones, including functionalities for predictive text, speech, handwriting recognition, and the company was successfully sold to my Motorola. Uh, following the acquisition, uh, he co-founded uh, Cellmania, a company that focused on mobile app store infrastructure software, and the company was successfully sold to BlackBerry. Um, and he has a PhD in engineering from Cambridge University, a master's from MIT, and uh, a Harkness Fellow at Stanford's uh, Rumhart uh, Lab in the psychology department, and has been featured on the cover of Fortune magazine for his early work with Neural Network. Who was that? Let's welcome Thank you. Dr. Nath. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So I've nothing to do with the National Algorithm Group to start off with. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so I'm an entrepreneur. What have we thought would start? I'll talk about 10 minutes, about a little bit about the business and uh, what are neural nets. It seems like we have a, a wide variety of people. Some people know lots about it. Some people are just starting. Um, and then talk about uh, now how what we're trying to do with Ursat's labs. And then Dave will continue and spend about 20 minutes on the um, uh, details of what we've actually implemented. And then we'll leave about 10 minutes for questions. So if I'd ask you to save any questions for me for the after Dave's talk, that would be um, ideal. Um, well, as Jake said, uh, yeah, I've been working on recognition technology, uh, smartphone uh, technology for pretty much 30 years. And my specialism is starting companies and selling them to phone companies, uh, Motorola and Blackberry. And uh, I've been in the engineering department, and I was here, I came to Stanford about 25 years ago uh, to work in uh, all places, the psychology department. And uh, there was a well-known professor called uh, Professor Rummelhart, who invented uh, what is known as the fact propagation algorithm, and popularized that. And uh, uh, in those days, you had to show up at the lab and work with people, and today you can actually do things through the internet. And what was it applied to? Okay, so it was applied to uh, handwriting recognition, <coughs> predictive text where you predict the next letter when you send an SMS text, uh, speech recognition, uh, voice dialing, and then we sort of did the earliest apps um, uh, and uh, mobile search engines, which is like circa 1999, uh, and a good eight years before that became mainstream. We were working on some of the earliest smartphones, which was circa 1997. <coughs> Uh, uh, and it, these things take time to get into the marketplace and become mainstream. And so deep learning, we'll talk about the history of that and you know, where we are now. Uh, so first of all, oops, uh, what's happened there? Let's see, uh, press the wrong button. Yeah. There we go, thank you. Yeah. So, so what is what is a neural network, and uh, what, what, what's so neural about it? Um, and what I'm going to talk about is just the very basics. It's going to have ten minutes, uh, and you know, what what are people uh, 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 what what actually is how does a network operate? So typically you have a pattern with inputs, and you go through what we call our layers of computational modules. I'll talk about what each of these combination modules are, is on the next slide. And then what's happening is there's calculations for in, within each of these modules that are fed forward to the next module. So what does a module like this look like? So you have inputs coming into the module, one of these circles, and you have a weight that multiplies the input. And then these inputs are summed up and then go through a function. And then once it's gone through a function, it then goes on to the next module. And that's a typical neural network. And a deep learning neural is typically what we mean by that. Is there are more than one layer. There's more layers. 
in, in 1990, we were typically looking at one or two hidden layers, and now we look at lots and lots of layers because we now, now have more computation power. And so what's, what's that got to do with the brain, right? And if you talk to um, uh, real neuroscientists, uh, they're, they're sometimes, um, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, have a little bit of askance on, you know, does it really, is this how the brain really works? And I think what, what computer science say, this is, yeah, this is a gross simplification of how the brain works, but what they, why it's inspired by it is the brain works in a similar way. You have inputs going into uh, a synapse, it's, it's computed, and then another output is going, is gone on to the, uh, from, uh, through the axon on the outside of a synapse, or outside of a neuron. And so that's why people call them neural networks. But you should think of them as like mathematical models that are inspired by that as opposed to exactly how the brain works. There's 10 to the power 11 uh, neurons in the, in, the, in, the, in the brain, and typically each neuron will have um, typically 100 or so connections. Um, and uh, typically the models that we build are not as big as those. And so this has actually been going on from since like the 1940s, and this is one of the earliest implementations. We were just thinking about just one neuron, um, and they had limited uh, applicability. And then in the 1950s, we had made a bit more pro uh, progress. Uh, in the 1960s, we said, um, that uh, the work that, that we hit a roadblock where there's a paper out of MIT by Minsky uh, that said that if you use these simple neurons, they couldn't solve nonlinear problems. As a result, people stopped for, uh, for about 10 years, 15 years. Um, in the 1980s, there was a way to solve nonlinear problems and also train these networks. We'd, we'd have many, many, many more neurons, many more net, uh, um, layers. And that was uh, uh, extremely popular in the late 80s. In the 1990s, you started seeing actual applications. So my first company was in 1991, uh, which was worked in the area of handwriting recognition, right? With cursive handwriting. Everybody else was doing print. We were working on cursive. And you found that in the 1990s, it started being applied to lots of different techniques, um, finance, uh, speech recognition, OCR. Uh, but typically it's part of an overall architecture. And there were many other popular techniques. In markup models as a technique, dynamic programming um, was a very popular technique, particularly in the time domain uh, areas. And typically the companies in the past that succeeded were people who looked at a problem, whether it's speech recognition or handwriting recognition, and tried to just solve the problem. And really, well, really want to focus whether it is it a neural net, is it a hidden markup model, is it a some other kind of classifier. Uh, today, we're seeing a resurgence, and why is this resurgence happening? One is it substantially increased computing powers, particularly with GPUs, uh, where we get like 50 times speed up. Second, lots and lots of data is available. Tons and tons of data is available, because you've got the web. Um, and third, you've got increased uh, uh, newer models and better training systems available. And people are now using this, again, in combination with uh, some of these other techniques. Uh, so there's much more interest because of these uh, more horsepower and more um, uh, improvements. There's also a lot of uh, tuition available in these areas. Uh, the Andrew Ng's famous uh, machine learning course, about 100,000 people show up uh, online. And there's uh, lots of universities, I'm not sure if CMU gives a course on it, but I uh, wouldn't be surprised. Um, uh, lots of areas, whereas 25 years ago, it was, it was a little bit more niche You have to go to uh, professors who were actually working on it. But talking about the hype machines, uh, I mean, this has sort of happened before. I'm not sure how many people remember this, but in like 1982, um, there was a famous presentation at the National Academy of Science, and uh, there was all this fuss about, like, you know, is, is Japan going to take over uh, science and technology? And they had something called the Jap Japanese fifth generation effort, which was going to try and create so-called real artificial intelligence. And uh, the UK, they announced uh, a 500 million pound uh, program to compete with that. Uh, in the US, uh, they had a similar um, uh, enhancement. 
1987, you had neural network conferences and 3,000 people would show up. Uh, so we're not quite there yet, but we're, we're starting getting, getting back there. And in 1990, pretty much every graph, if you had to have a neural net in it, uh, uh, in, in, to, to, to sort of get uh, heavy targeting in, in this area. And even me, I got on the cover of Fortune magazine, uh, uh, which uh, you know, we were only a three-person company. And uh, uh, what you're seeing is now uh, you can almost write the same article. You know, we're still looking at these techniques for text, search, um, robotics, speech, handwriting, uh, interfaces. And what, would, what, what we started uh, Ursat's lab, and I'm now going to sort of hand over to uh, Dave in uh, 30 seconds, is can we have Ursat's labs, can we have these techniques used in an easier way? Right. This, uh, can you actually get on board of these kind of systems without <coughs> having to rewrite the code all over again? And uh, you know, right now we're sort of like targeting um, uh, uh, data specialists who would like to go home at night and look after their kids instead of rewriting uh, uh, everything. Uh, but you know, you can play it forward. You know, can you actually get to the level of a database? Right, where people in the olden days used to write our own database, <coughs> and now we don't. We just use Oracle or My, MySQL and, uh, and use it as a tool. People where you want to predict something or cluster something. So I'll just hand it over to Dave, and he'll tell you what ERSAT means <laughs> as a start. I've <laughs> got the next slide, Dave. Oh, yep. So I see you have a self-introduction uh, already. So yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can we walk up the panel because? Uh, yeah, just hit maybe the, the little maximize uh, in the upper right corner. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Sullivan, CEO, uh, co founder of Versace Labs. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the, the future of neural networks now that Ron John has told us a little bit um, about the past. And uh, before I get started, uh, somebody asked what Ersatz Labs even means. Uh, so Ersatz, Ersatz, really, is a German word that literally means replacement. It uh, is kind of a slang word for artificial or uh, usually used in a pejorative sense. So you might say Ersatz coffee is uh, kind of like really bad coffee, you know, not very good. Uh, so why would you name a company after that? It's because I got a sick sense of humor. Uh, basically, but it's first hats as in you know artificial, as in artificial intelligence, and it's kind of a play on words there. So <clears throat> that's that's the uh, the story with with ersatz. Now, um, so what do we do? Uh, as, as Ron John was kind of explaining, uh, we make a GPU-backed platform for building and deploying uh, machine learning algorithms. Right now, where we started was focusing only on deep learning, and it started out of my personal need for better deep learning tools. Uh, uh, this would have been a couple years ago. I was starting to play around with deep learning pretty seriously. Uh, you do have a variety of tools out there. You've got Theano, you've got Torch, you've got PyLearn, you've got um, CUDA CompNet, uh, you've got uh, CAFE now. So there's all these open source projects, but each one has its own learning curve. Each one is kind of difficult to get started with. And, uh, and they're kind of all these models and methods and stuff are kind of spread across all these different sources. Uh, so. I got the idea, well, hey, what if I could make this easier? What if I could uh, build kind of a web application around this, have one kind of interface that I could manage all my machine learning projects through, uh, you know, manage ensembles, manage models, uh, and then scale it easily? Does something like that really exist? And it didn't, uh, not for deep learning at least. Uh, you were starting to see a couple of machine learning as a service kind of startups. Uh, pop up. Um, so I said, okay, there's probably an opportunity there. Uh, but what I got into, and I'll go into this in a minute, but let me start at kind of a higher level. Okay, so let's talk about machine learning in general. Where is machine learning going? Where is it now? Um, 
you've got data, all right? You can call it big data. I tend not to because it's in every airport. But the larger uh, narrative of data being important is absolutely true. Uh, and, and I don't really see a future where it's going to be less important. I don't see a future, you know, it may or may not be deep learning, it may or not be some specific method, some specific software package, but I don't see a future where machine learning itself and data itself is going to be less important than it is today. So you're going to need tools to deal with that. So there's basically two types of tools as I see it when it comes to data. There's collecting it, there's making sense of it. Collecting it is infrastructure, uh, basically managing it, security models, uh, so on, uh, moving it around, uh, large amounts, small amounts, whatever. Uh, and then you've got to make sense of it, which is really machine learning. That's the part that we do. Um, so, all right, you've got some data. What do you want to do with it, with machine learning? Well, the first thing you want to do is you visualize. All right, so you've got you know, PCA, you've got ISO maps, you've got TSNE if you want to get fancy. There's various ways to, to visualize that, right? Then you want to train some models, okay? You've got uh, you know, random forests, you've got support vector machines, you've got neural networks, when, which in and of itself is like this whole field where there's all of these different models and architectures and complexity involved in training them, uh, less so in running them, but still a little bit. Um, and then once you've trained some models, you uh, want to put them in an ensemble uh, because it turns out that oftentimes if you average a bunch of models together, sometimes from different architectures, that that whole group will actually perform better than any of its individual member components. And then you got to confirm your results. You got to pull up uh, some kind of charts, some kind of statistics, some kind of confusion matrix. Um, and you've got to make sure, can I trust these answers enough to put it into a production system? And then you want to run it at scale. All right. So then you say, OK, great. I've got this thing in MATLAB. And now I need to write it onto our <coughs> application and have it run very fast and have it run for, for many, many users. Um, so if you want to do all that, what does that look like today? What do you actually have to do? And, and, and basically what you end up with, and I, you know, I've kind of got the, the wall of text here, but you need to be a Python programmer or a MATLAB programmer or an R programmer. You've got to be a data scientist, right? And what is a data scientist? A data scientist to me is just somebody that is very familiar with mathemat applied mathematics and statistics and somebody that's very familiar with programming. And those are kind of the two areas that need to be bridged. And it's actually really hard to find that skill set. You usually have somebody who's stronger in one or the other. Um, but you kind of need that set of skills. OK, then once you've got that, you've got a variety of libraries you can choose from. Or you can build it yourself if you've got enough time to do that. Um, but each one has quirks. If you want to run it across a bunch of different architectures and models and stuff, you've got to build all that yourself. So you write your own ensemble management code, your own APIs your own data hooks, own experiment runner, uh, and you're writing a lot of code that you may or may not be able to ever reuse, uh, or there may or may not be something better that, that comes along that just makes it unnecessary. Uh, so the question is, can that state of the art be improved? So if you're going to improve it, what would that even look like? What would a better machine learning workflow look like? And I think, and I believe, a fundamental part of it is faster time to results. Okay. How quickly can you start with data and get, uh, get the data visualized, get a bunch of classifiers trained on it, confirm those results, and put it in production? How fast can you do that? And can you do that with one application? Then what if you could standardize the interface? All right? And we'll use web as a platform, so it'll be a web application with an API. And uh, it'll run anywhere, it'll run in the cloud. It doesn't matter uh, what hardware you have, because we can host the hardware anywhere. Uh, we can also do it on-premises if you want, because a lot of companies are going to have problems with sending their data up to the cloud. So there's a lot of flexibility there. And then you want it to be updated quickly. So as new research comes out, and this is particularly true in, in deep learning right now, because it's changing very, very quickly, you need it to be pretty flexible, and I would say even model agnostic. Okay. So if there's a, a new technique that comes out, you've got to be able to add that quickly, and a user of that product would have to expect that that capability was, was able to be added quickly. Um, and then kind of this overall idea of, look, you know, don't make me program unless I have to. Try to you know, have a visual workflow. Try to make this easy. Maybe not so easy that the CEO or the, the chief marketing officer can do it, but easier than it is right now. Cut down on the amount of code that you have to write for every project you're going to do. It's also extendable by the user. So you know, you bring the software in, you've got some models that you've already built yourself or whatever, most companies do. They're going to need to integrate this into the pipeline if that pipeline is going to be running their machine learning services. 
Um, and then you want it supported because it's hard to get support on a lot of the machine learning tools that are available. Wouldn't it be great if uh, you had access to support from a team uh, that you don't have to hire yourself and, and you know post? Um, so basically, what you're thinking, what I'm thinking, is is a glue layer for all your machine learning tools, right? Um, and what that ends up looking like is something like this. And this is actually what Ursatz is. And it didn't start this way. It actually turned into this. And, and I'll show you show you what I've got here. Let's, let's, yeah, there we go. Um, so you basically got the web app, right? Which is Ursat. So if you go to, oh yes. <laughs> so if you go to uh, you know api.ursats1.com, you'll end up at the web app, and that's basically an interface that you can actually. I'll, I'll show you screenshots in a second. Um, then you've got your REST API, okay? That's how you communicate with everything behind the scenes. Uh, so you communicate programmatically uh, if you want. And then we've got vertical specific modules. That's something more specific to the business side. What we're finding is that uh, it's tough to make something that anybody can just pick up and use, right? So we found that we really need to package our software with services, right? So we come into companies and basically they're curious, hey look, how do I use deep learning? But more than that, um, what can I do with machine learning? What's the latest and greatest? You know, How can I find out if it works for my purposes or not? Uh, so we help companies do that and that's kind of part of the offering. Um, and, and we do that through these vertical specific modules which target, you know, say financial services or uh, medical imaging, um, and they're just kind of add-ons. Then you've got this data manager, which is actually kind of an important component because when you actually look at all of these different machine learning libraries, uh, most of them don't really have a, a way to uh, be super flexible in the way you put in data. So maybe you can point it at a CSV, or maybe they have a special format that they expect you to put it in, or you just use a pickle, or, and I'm speaking mostly from a Python perspective. Uh, for what it's worth, but uh, what we did was we basically built this thing that is capable of, of receiving data, transforming it efficiently, and then streaming it to the training algorithms and, and, uh, and models as needed. Then on top of all that, we've got this ensemble manager, which basically manages all your experiments. You can almost think of it as a, as a project, like in the machine learning sense, but then it's got things that'll you know average the, the outputs together and um, allow you to add different models and, and compare them. And, uh, swap them out and so on. Then you've got your models under here, um, which can be you know one to n. And then from there, this is kind of you know this is the big ersatz meat and potatoes. And then from there, you've got specific backends, right? Which is PyLearn two. So right now, this was kind of where ersatz started. Which you know we we tried building the algorithms ourselves first, and that worked fine. But we found that every time we do that, it took a really long time. So something new comes out, and there's a bunch of interface features we want to add. So do we re-implement models every time a new paper comes out, or do we focus on what we do well, which is the interface, which is the user experience, which is uh, making this thing cohesive? Uh, so we made the decision, basically, to be model agnostic and to be library agnostic. And basically, all of this hooks in to these model backends, and that's what we build. So if we come into a company and they've already got a system set up, we build a model backend for them. If there's some library that they want to use or some software, whatever, we build that model backend and then what's called a runner, which basically takes the ersatz model that you've trained and then runs it um, in your software. So that's the basic architecture with ersatz. And let me tell you, uh, show you kind of what that looks like in practice. So, so this is a use case where we've got uh, loan prediction, okay? And this is a, a client where they're basically uh, using algorithmic factors to determine whether or not they should uh, purchase a unsecured loan or not. Um, and you start out with the data, all right, which fits in Excel in this case. Um, so you got a CSV. Um, you can visualize it. This is actually a new feature. So this is a TSNE visualizer. Um, and basically what, the, what TSNE is, you can think of it just like PCA, but it deals with the crowding problem a lot better. Um, so you typically end up with better clusters, this being kind of a bad example, but you know you, you want to see some separation here. So you've kind of got this cluster over here, and then you can kind of see they, they cluster there. But you can also see there's a lot of uh, intermixing there. Anyway, once you visualize it, or you upload it, and then you visualize it, um, you, we kind of give you this data dashboard that you can manage. So like one of the things you can do is transform the data, all right? So you, you know, you upload some data, you've got different columns that you can select. Maybe you want to try a different, couple different combinations of those columns. Hey, we're going to include, you know, this set in, in one, we're going to include this set in the next experiment. Um, 
and and that is, is data specific. So the options you get, you know, when you upload images are different than when you just upload CSV or or whatever. Um, and then once you've transformed your data, you've got your data set set up, normalized it. Um, you then select your model, okay? And based on the type of data that you've uploaded and the options that you've chosen, we suggest models that are available to you. Um, and as we add models, as we add backends, and as we add custom modules, they basically end up in this list right here. You know, so basically, again, depending on the type of data you're working with and the type of objective, uh, you're gonna see different models. Uh, in this case, we've just got a deep net and an auto encoder. Um, once you've chosen your model, uh, you're gonna train it. All right, and this is act this all happens on GPU. So basically how this works is on Amazon, we've got the actual web server, job server, kind of thing, right? But then separately, we have co-located GPU servers um, because it turns out that building them yourself actually ends up being, they run quite a bit faster uh, than if you use Amazon right now. Um, and basically they train, you know, anywhere between 20 and 50 times faster uh, than on CPU. Uh, using GPUs. So that's actually a really important component and the user doesn't really have to think about any of that. They don't have to worry about setting it up. They don't have to worry about having the right drivers. They don't have to worry about if there's some conflict with some, you know, the specific version that's available today only works with CUDA from a few versions ago. We take care of all of that. Um, and then from there you've got to analyze your results. So, you know, you've got confusion matrices. Um, and then you want to use your models. Now you've got a model trained. All right, it's good to go. You've verified it, everything looks good. You've got a testing set, training set, validation set. And now you wanna actually use your model to make predictions. We have <coughs> two options for that. We have a web interface that you can use, which will give you nice pretty graphs and uh, readouts and accuracy, and you, know, you can test visually. Or we have an API, uh, which primarily you use when you actually integrate this into your application. So you have new data coming in. You can update your model. It is an online method, uh, all, you know, uh, deep learning uh, neural network methods typically are. Um, so you can update your model as you go, you can use it to make new predictions, um, and it just kind of, uh, kind of runs that way. And then the goal here is, you know, will they default or not? It puts out a little output probability. So point being, uh, a lot of people kind of get hung up on this whole idea of deep learning versus machine learning, right? But I just want to point out that deep learning is, is it's, it goes machine learning, neural networks, deep learning. That's kind of the, the Venn diagram or whatever. And basically, uh, there, there's nothing inherently like uh, that, that, that makes neural networks better than everything else. I'm not up here saying that you should only be using neural networks. The reason that we focus on that is because I think it is the most interesting area of machine learning research right now. But from a user's perspective, the inputs and the outputs don't change. You're still mostly doing classification problems. You're still doing regression problems. Uh, you're still clustering your data. Um, you're still generating features that you can then feed up into other algorithms from there. Uh, so, so wrapping your head around the, the how and why of neural networks is a lot more difficult than actually just using them in practice. Um, and then this is where you split your data. That's parameters. Yeah, and uh, that's kind of brings me up to where I'm at, so any questions, anyone? So, so when you send your data for learning through the GPUs, do you have a specific, your own scheduler, I mean, is it something like a patch system? Do you use any existing one? Or you yeah, I mean, it's just a job server, um, you know, so we're using RabbitMQ, um, I see. You know, and, uh, just a job server, basically. GPU workers, Rabbit. I have a basic definition question, what's REST? Oh, um, REST, uh, yeah, what, what does REST stand for? <laughs> there you go. It's, it's, an, it's a, what was it? Representational state transfer. I know, it doesn't sound like It's a Roy Friedman thesis. It's how the web talks to itself. Yeah. Thank you. Just means it's a transaction based API. No, what have people that hands up? So in the example you showed the spreadsheet, I mean, um, obviously you also um, considering application like multimedia data type. Um, so we would say data ingest actually become a bottleneck here because you ex the customer <coughs> can upload it um, before they actually can do the training and build the model. Okay. So like, um, can, can you upload without Excel you mean? Oh yeah, oh, I know you definitely can. Right. Well, my question is, 
beyond the Excel, beyond you know spreadsheet, those kind of things type, you would be maybe more constrained by the uploading uh, the time consumed at that phase compared with the model, the training, and the um, building phase. Yeah, so I, I mean, so like images, for example, that's a good example. You can upload, you can put, if you want to do image classification, you can create folders that are your classes, and then you put images directly in there, JPEGs, GIFs, whatever, um, and then you upload that file to ERSATs, we'll handle all the conversion, and then we store it as a HCF5 uh, file. Um, which, uh, my point being that we take care of the conversion for you. So if it's not CSV data, that's okay, we actually support a couple other types and we're adding more like audio, video, uh, we support images right now. You're rewriting the models or you're using, I, I get this, are you re-implementing the models? No, you're not, not if we can avoid it. Some of them we do, but uh, okay, some so of them we can avoid it. So then basically you don't have to re-verify a lot of the models, so you're kind of selecting the numbers. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, I have two questions. The first one is about uh, the code that's run on the GPUs. What kind, what kind of optimizations do you perform? both on the code itself and the runtime. I mean, what if you do you try to do some kind of clever scheduling to utilize the GPUs better or just you use just a straight for, for a way? Um, I mean, it varies, nothing specific, you know. Um, we found it to be fast enough. Uh, so like we use Theano, for example, mostly. Uh, Kudamat is another library we use. Mm -hmm. um, we do very little direct programming, uh, like C++ with, you know, with GPU. Um, so we're kind of working at a higher level. Um, and I mean, it's pretty fast. Okay. And uh, my second question is about the storage. Uh, what kind of technologies do you use for storing the data? Do you use uh, NoSQL databases, a distributed file system, or or do you use uh, S3? Guys, the only two companies. Yeah, so, and that's that's a good question. So um, I don't think there are many examples of that. I think that all your machine learning models are typically going to have, it, it, there's a name for it, there's a set of parameters that it's going to accept that you have to choose, which we use Bayesian optimization to, to determine. Uh, so that's kind of like a feature we have in our sites. Um, but, I mean, we don't really uh, know that. For example, the CRF is one of the models on the CRF ratio I mean, why, why don't you come and ask us uh, after the talk if you have like a specific use case? Because it's like, well, okay, we don't have that model. Is there something we could use that would solve your problem that would be just as good? Um, and there probably is. And if not, we should probably add that. Right? So that's kind of been the approach we've taken. Um, that hasn't really been a problem so far. Can I get back? I wonder if you could say something about it. Of your clients, how many ask for the on-premise solution versus the cloud-based solution? The bigger the company, the more likely they are to ask for the in-house solution. Back. Yeah. The question I had was, um, have you heard of Spark and uh, ML Base? Yeah, kind of. Um, well, Spark is the, uh, yeah, right, Spark, the, um, Right. The new Hadoop, right? And, and they're talking about ML Base, which is a machine learning database where they allow to automatically pick the right model. Yeah. Because when you say you have to pick a model, how does the user decide which model to pick? We tell them. Yeah. And uh, no, I agree. That That is something that I imagine more than one person is working on. You know, um, And picking the right model, I think, is a good area to be looking at. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with the one you mentioned. I am with Spark, but it's not the also one. coming out of Berkeley. Actually, there's a paper out there you can see. So the question I have is, um, in in terms of what's going on with the machine learning effort uh, for with Spark, how do you, how does the GPU architecture fit into the speed up? Because you know, there's a great role for memory, a great role for reduction of uh, arrays, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so I mean, neural networks aren't, uh, there, there are many batch methods, so you don't have to work, you know, if you've got, you know, terabytes and terabytes of data, you don't have to look at it all at once. Um, you can parallelize it, you know, uh, with data across multiple GPUs. Um, but fundamentally, I mean, even if you, like, uh, we were talking to some guys, they had like, like 100,000 columns, 
very sparse data, um, and then like 12 million rows, or something like that. And then they want to feed that into an autoencoder, which is difficult, but how about we just do a simple dimensionality reduction on it, shrink it down, and then run it through, and then we're fine. Um, so, and that's it's kind of hints to my you know point earlier. I said you know we, we tried to make it so easy that anybody could do it. Like you could say, oh, can I use this? And I could say yes, and then you would go use it, and that's it. Turns out we actually have to have a conversation uh, about how to use it, how to apply it to your problem, and we probably have to change some things. And that's why we've got a kind of product services package. Can you check that? Do you have any slides? That thing sounds really fascinating. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, do you have any, yeah. what is that thing? I mean, yeah. that's pretty neat. <laughs> or could be, I, I, I don't know how much effort you have to take. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, this, this is where you pick your model. So based on the type of data you upload, um, it's going to present you with different models, and then we have this ensemble runner, basically, so you can create a bunch of models. <laughs> Uh, you click one of those buttons. <laughs> 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 it's done. Well, no, it depends on the type of what they're trying to do. Are they? Well, any plans to, 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 I mean, you could put some real stuff in there. You're not, you're not yet I, Yeah, I mean, I, that, that was not on today's list. Okay. But, but no, I agree. That would be a good thing to have. I think we're <clears> moving <throat> in that direction already. Yeah. Like, so unless, yeah. is there like a specific interface change you'd recommend? No, no, not, not at all. I, I like what I saw with the model thing. I think it's a great idea for selling this to a non-MATLAB person. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not sure it can be done, but I really can. We've got seen it. We're trying to figure that out. Yeah. <coughs> a couple more, I think we've got a couple more minutes. What about the memory? Is it everything in memory there? Yeah, so, um, I mean, you basically got CPU memory, you got GPU memory, and then you've got your disk, and it's basically you got to manage between that and try to do it as intelligently as possible. So if you have you know, very large data, you load as much as going to fit into the system memory. And then you have the GPU with as much memory as basically with the model and the data at the same time. Yeah. Um, we'll see how parallelization goes. Kind of more the operational integration side. Could you describe the typical engagement cycle? Yeah, typically, typically someone just signs up. Any of you can just sign up on our site and you get an account and you can actually just start loading their data. And then usually we find that if someone's actually wants to try to do a, a serious project, they usually call us up and say, well, okay, I've tried, I've uploaded it, how do I use it a bit better? And then we usually say, okay, uh, here's some pointers how you want to work. Um, but Usually they say, well, <coughs> how can you help with the consulting arrangement? And we usually say, let's have a little three month consulting project and we'll work with you. We have nickel and dime you. We can use a, have unlimited minutes uh, on, the, uh, on, on the cloud. Right now we charge by the minute, uh, we give it an hour free. Um, and so we have a program. We say, let's just get rid of the nickel and dime and let's just work on your project and your problem. And then after that, Works or doesn't work, you can continue on. Over there. So, uh, do you use a model uh, of uh, collect all the data uh, in advance, or do they provide just algorithms to how to analyze the data? You've got to bring your own data. Yeah. yeah. Um, we can help you decide what data to collect so depending on the problem. So, if you, um, if you have clients that Provide their own data for your model. Oh, the usual case. Yeah. So, do you download this data or you just um, build a uh, neural network? So, what you do is upload your data. You've got your own data, just like the loan prediction that the client had their own data, they uploaded it, and then you choose it, it presents a set of models for you to choose from based on what it sees in the data and what you're trying to do. No, and then you pick one of those models and you run it, and then you uh, then try it on a test set, a separate part of the data, uh, and then <coughs> see what that result is, and then iterate. So do I need to upload this data? Yes. My data or just provide um, like a full API to my, to my data? Either you got yeah. you, you got to send it 
you know, into the system somehow, um, whether that's via the API or upload or whatever you want. Um, and then, of course, it could be in-house or in the cloud, too, depending on what kind of security needs you have. I think it's 7.45. That's fine. Well, yeah, if there is okay. some okay. other questions, okay. right. yeah. let's do one. Uh, okay, there's a question over there. Uh, if user wants to make a model which has large amount of parameter, let's say one billion parameter, how can you handle that? <coughs> Yeah, so there's three papers. There's three papers I'd recommend reading, and it's it is it's a harder question than it sounds. Um, so there was the first one with Google with the whole uh, unsupervised kind of cat things or whatever YouTube videos. That's kind of where it started. A year later, um, you know Andrew and, and Nvidia, I think. Um, you know, that was the, me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So they probably speak to that. Um, but uh, they they did it faster and better and cheaper. Uh, we using GPUs. Um, and then the other paper I've read more recently is an Alex Krzyzewski paper uh, where they kind of does a survey of some of the parallelization options. I mean, the easy answer is there's no good solution at this point, um, so we haven't bothered adopting one. But, uh, you know, that's something, it's an interesting area of research if you've, uh, if you've got anything. So, uh, Worcester, do you have any questions about the main business model? I mean, there is. Google Analytics engines and those so, kind of ways. How do you? Yeah, so a platform, right now it's a platform play, and it's a mix of platform and services. So as I said, you know, right now we've got a model where you can, you can basically, um, you get so much time for free, and then what thereafter you have to pay by the minute. Um, and then what we, again, what we usually find is um, a customer will say, well, I want a specific project done. And uh, because we've got like 85% of it done on the platform, we don't have to write from scratch like a, a classic consulting company would have to do. We say, okay, fine, let's help you work. So do the remaining 50% and, uh, and build it that way. And then in that process, we add more features to the platform. And uh, the theory is that uh, new deployments get more efficiently done at a lower cost. Than, uh, but then, uh, you produce a model, uh, yes. presumably it meets the client's yes. uh, needs, but then there could be a continuous yes. stream of classification exactly. tasks. Would that only take place on your platform, or is there like some kind of If you put yeah. it on the platform, then we can charge a call. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to get lock you in. Uh, or you can use the we don't want. Yeah, or you can yeah. use the model, and it's kind of a model that if it's, it's not used very much, it's kind of like a Google Maps thing. You know, if you don't use it very much, then no one gets charged. But if you start using it a lot, then, um, then then we have to come to a license arrangement. So academics and people are just doing toy problems, they can use it. Uh, but if it's, if it's a, a large, <coughs> continuous problem, then I mean, the bottom line is it's all negotiable. You know, I think, like I said, when we started the business, the idea was, okay, you just sign up, self-serve, you know, et cetera. Um, but, you know, it's a complex product. And the people that have these types of problems, uh, there's a lot of value in solving those problems. So. Uh, basically, everything's negotiable. Each engagement is pretty high ticket, um, not incredibly high ticket, but you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so we just kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's high touch right now, early on. So I can't export the data from my model out of your service. You can. Oh, oh we don't want okay. to. Yeah, yeah. 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 You you got to write your own uh, feed that's forward fine, code, fine. but uh, we're also yeah. changing that soon. So yeah. we'll give you even give you the feed forward, just not the training. Okay. Uh, so, uh, is your platform specifically geared towards uh, problems that are that require a lot of processing power? So, do you use that very capable or <coughs> the algorithm? Or something about the case where you know, processing is not as much of an issue, but still there's benefits of availability of the algorithm it, integration? It depends. We're looking for high value machine learning problems. That's, you know, if you have a high value machine learning problem that is like a real problem for your business where increasing those results by say like 25% would make a meaningful impact in your business, um, that's kind of kind of where we're targeting right now. And we can use a lot of different methods to do that, you know, that's kind of my point. So what kind of specifics are numbers do you see with your models currently? Uh, sorry, go again. What kind of precision with all numbers are you seeing with your models currently? Uh, like in general, yeah, best case, nine hundred percent. Best case, I mean, well, MNIST. I mean, what's what's state of the art at MNIST right now with Comcast? Like ninety nine point nine nine something. Okay. So that's pretty good, but that's MNIST, which is an easy data set. 
right. So maybe last. There is one question behind the column that you may not oh, have sorry. seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> You're blocked. <laughs> right. So I was wondering if you could talk about the network performance that's required to get good uh, service out of your system. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, good network performance. Mm -hmm. so, I, so like, me, what do you mean? Let me try it this way. Um, if you were to categorize the installed Ethernet bandwidth in your most successful customers. Is that 1 gig, 10 gig, 100 gig, you know, what what level of network performance makes all of this stuff sync? I mean, 10 gigabyte, gigabyte Ethernet, you know, um, a data center, <laughs> you know, I, it really... Do you have any data in that area? No. Oh, okay. No. It's, I mean, it, it's just never, it's never been a problem. Like, literally, that has never been a problem. Um, <laughs> For uh, experiments they've done, uh, like the one that you worked on, actually, they used InfiniBand, uh, you know, which is like high-speed uh, network card, basically, and that uh, really made a big improvement because they needed a fast way to get uh, basically model parameters from GPU uh, to other systems and share it across systems. Uh, for our purposes, though, I mean, again, literally, it's just never been a problem. Your multiple always fit more GPU, though, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's why it's in both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fine. One last <laughs> question. So what, what was the largest, uh, more, not the model, but the, the case where you had the largest data that you wanted to set up? 10 terabyte, uh, petabyte? No, um, like 10 gigabytes, probably. Yeah. We don't have guys coming to us with like petabytes and stuff. So. so, I mean, I would imagine that once you have the larger data <laughs> you have, the more IO and the network yeah. performance. Yeah. Will yeah, but it also is, I mean, it's a mini batch method. So, like, you know, you just run it more, for more iterations when you have more data. Um, and you might need to use a bigger model. And then you can run into a bottleneck where it's like you've got too many parameters to fit. I see. Um, but fundamentally, it's pretty flexible. I see. Great. Thank you. Was that, uh, <laughs> nice. let's thank the speakers. All right, so uh, just a five minute uh, bio break uh, for drinks and uh, a bathroom if you need to. Uh, and